scope of the original Army investigation of the incident which allegedly took place March 16th, 1968 in Sanmi village in Vietnam. Lieutenant General William R. Pierce was designated to conduct the inquiry. In early December of last year, at his request, two outside civilian attorneys were made available to assist him. Mr. Robert McCrate and his associate, Mr. Jerome K. Walsh, Jr. Both distinguished attorneys agreed to assist as representatives of the public. Yesterday, the Piers McCrate report was submitted to General Westmoreland and me. It is based on interviews with some 400 witnesses, both here and in Vietnam, and an, ex and an exhaustive review of files and records in South Vietnam and the United States. The testimony of the witnesses, when fully transcribed, will total nearly 20,000 pages. The report consists of 12 chapters, totaling over 225 pages. Because it was necessary for the peers group to familiarize itself with the events leading to the alleged incident, three chapters of the report deal with those allegations. They cannot be made public at this time because of the obvious potential for prejudice in ongoing court-martial cases. Three more chapters deal with the nature and adequacy of subsequent reports and investigations concerning the alleged incident. These chapters, a summary chapter and a chapter containing conclusions and recommendations, also cannot be made public at this time because of the possible prejudice to the military justice actions against the 14 officers who have been charged this past weekend. These charges are being announced today. The remainder of the report, with some minor deletions of classified or prejudicial information, is being released to the public today. Ultimately, substantially all of the report will be made public. General Piers, Mr. McCrate, and their associates have worked past two years old at the time their investigation began. It is clear from reviewing the report that they have done an exhaustive and forthright job. Now that the inquiry has been completed, we must continue to assure that the processes of the military justice system are permitted to operate fairly and fully. The officers charged in the past several days with failures to adequately investigate and report, as is the case with those persons charged previously with offenses arising directly from the alleged incident itself, are entitled fully to the presumption of innocence which applies in our system of justice. Finally, General Westmoreland and I particularly wish to express our deep appreciation to Mr. McCrate and to Mr. Walsh for their assistance in this important and difficult task. 
Thank you. Not been an easy one. From the very start, it was clear that the primary requirement had to be absolute objectivity. It was also clear that the rights of the individuals affected by the inquiry must be protected. I feel satisfied that these two requirements have been met. That they have been fulfilled is due in large part to the people who assisted me in the, in the investigation or the inquiry. As for the military officers on the team, I deliberately avoided selecting senior colonels and general officers to serve on the team. I wanted young combat experienced officers who had seen war and who knew the trials and the pressures and the tribulations of combat firsthand. To meet this need, General Westmoreland made available to me some of the most highly talented officers in the United States Army. Each of these officers is highly decorated and each has had combat experience from the platoon level through the brigade level and all of them are recent Vietnam veterans. I would like to publicly express my appreciation to them for their highly professional and untiring efforts during the course of the inquiry. <coughs> this same degree of devotion was exhibited by all of the enlisted personnel who were assigned to the inquiry team. <clears throat> I owe a particular debt of gratitude to the gentleman on my right, Mr. Robert McCrate, and to his associate on my left, Mr. Jerome Walsh. These two civilian lawyers brought to the inquiry a breadth of knowledge and experience which has been absolutely invaluable to all of us. Their advice and counsel throughout the hearing and the long deliberations which followed were of immeasurable assistance in arriving at the difficult decisions which had to be made. They have given freely and completely of themselves. To my sincere word of thanks, I can only add that I think that they have done a great service to their country. <clears throat> it may seem somewhat unusual, but I would like also to thank you of the press who have been so patient and so considerate. By not putting pressure upon me for information, you've made my task easier many times over and have permitted me and other members of the inquiry to devote our full attention to the problems of the investigation itself. There were and there still are overriding considerations to protect the rights of those who are involved in the judicial proceedings. Your actions to date have done much to protect these rights, and I would hope that such would continue. <clears throat> On several occasions, I have been asked about what happened in Sonmi Village on 16 March 1968. I'm not going to try to characterize what occurred there. I can say, however, and I feel that the public is entitled to know, that our inquiry clearly established that a tragedy of major proportions occurred there on that date. In order not to prejudice the rights of individuals concerned, I am unable to further discuss the events which transpired in Sonmi on 16 March of 1968. And over, over 500 pieces of documentary evidence. I am sure that the report will receive a thorough review by Secretary Reeser and by General Westmoreland and by the Department of the Army staff. I am most hopeful that our report, the reviews which it will receive, and the actions stemming from the report itself and such reviews from it will prevent an incident such as this from ever again occurring. Thank you very much. I think Mr. McCrate now has a few words he'd like to say. You will find in the material that has been distributed to you a memorandum of mine recording my concurrence in the basic findings of the inquiry and my satisfaction with the manner in which it has been conducted. And I would refer to that memorandum for a fuller statement of uh, my attitude towards this inquiry and in 
uh, the way it has been conducted. As a lawyer, would you ask answer one of the minor questions first? What is Miss Perkin? If that's the word. <laughs> Uh, that is a term specially known to military justice, and I would be inclined to defer to the uh, JAG officers <laughs> to give you a definition. <laughs> I, I, I feel that a definition of that sort you must be rather precise in uh, giving, and I think we, I better refer you to the JAG officers for that. We, we don't have a definition for you. General, General Piers, uh, after all this, uh, would you say that there was a cover-up in the field investigation uh, following the Milai incident? No. Uh, I would respond to your question by saying that <clears throat> there was <clears throat> testimony and evidence to indicate that certain individuals, either wittingly or unwittingly, uh, by their action, uh, <clears throat> suppressed information from the incident from uh, being passed up the chain of command. General, the men charged in this incident all have been charged with pretty horrific crimes. The officers, except for the last two, I think, captains mentioned in your report, uh, are being charged with much, much less serious uh, involvement in this thing. Under the principle that an officer is responsible for the conduct of his men, uh, how do you justify this? Uh, I don't uh, justify it, frankly. Uh, I think uh, first you must recognize that my responsibility was to investigate the incident, uh, to determine the adequacy of the reports, uh, the adequacy of uh, the review, the investigations, the sufficiency of the reviews of such uh, investigations, and whether or not there had been any attempt to uh, suppress information or to uh, cover it up. That was my obligation, which I fulfilled when I uh, filed the report. Now, as far as the charges themselves are concerned, uh, <clears throat> I did not file the charges. These were made by a group of <clears throat> officers who reviewed the testimony and, based upon the testimony, were able to determine the charges. General Pierce, how many of these officers did knowingly suppress information about whatever happened with the song on that day? I don't know. Uh, you would have to uh, read the, you have it in, in here, I believe. I, I would hate to come up with uh, uh, an exact count right now, but it, it's in the charges that you have. Who formally, uh, isn't there a requirement that the an accuser should be senior to an officer uh, to file the charges against General Foster? I don't think that, no, this is not correct, uh, what you say. No, it is not. Who, who did actually sign the uh, charges against They were signed by, in the case of General Coster, they were signed by uh, a colonel of the Army who is a, an officer of the Judge Advocate General Corps, or, and his name is uh, Hubert uh, Miller, and he is currently the staff judge advocate of the uh, <coughs> ARADCOM. General Pierce, several of the officers are charged with false swearing. Do those charges refer to the time two years ago or more recent, for example, during your investigation? <coughs> for the greater part, uh, they would refer to uh, the testimony given during the course of the inquiry. Are serious with these charges, sir? What, um, what is the ultimate sentence for the worst of them, and which of the charges is the, the heaviest? I'm not really qualified to, to answer your question. Uh, I am sure that this information can be given to you by the Judge Advocate General's office, and I'm sure that General uh, Seidel will make it available to you. General uh, Pierce, as a career professional in the Army, are you disturbed at all by the fact that 14 officers, some quite high-ranking and senior, uh, were engaged in the suppression of information and false swearing, and by implication in condoning 
this breach of the tragedy as you described it? Well, certainly, I'm greatly concerned. And it wouldn't make any difference whether it was, it does make a difference whether it's a general officer, but I think the same criterion must be in effect throughout our entire officer corps. We all have obligations as officers. And as a consequence, I think that we must have extremely high standards and that we must make sure that our people, our officers, stand up to those requirements. Well, would you say that this, in effect, condemns all of your officer corps since such a large group was involved? By no means. Very typical of all the officers? No. Far from it. I would look upon this, from what I know of the situation, as being quite an isolated incident. Sir, what is your feeling about what caused this? Why did we have a succession of people who suppressed information? Well, there is no ready and simple answer to your question. Very frankly, if you will notice in your handout, there is one section of our report which is devoted to that very subject. But I would be afraid that if I discuss this at the present moment, that it might be prejudicial to the interest of the people involved. Mr. McCray, could you indicate in this report where the best summary is of what you're talking about? You mentioned your conclusion. Do you have a page there you can tell us about? Well, one question that was asked of me related to Chapter 8. I believe that General Pierce has just referred to that. In addition, in Chapter 12, you will find that the findings of the inquiry are included. Now, in view of the fact that those findings relate intimately to individuals and charges that have been made against individuals, it is not possible at this time, in fairness to the judicial proceedings that will go forward or that are going forward in some cases, to make public that information at this time. Mr. McCray, I would like to ask you again a question we asked when we first met. And that is, during the course of the investigation, did any of the witnesses appearing before the commission take the Fifth Amendment and refuse to testify? They did. How many? I do not feel it appropriate to go into the details of that due to the possible prejudice to individual rights. But there were, in approximately five or six who did. General Pierce, is there any evidence that the type of behavior that you, these charges are based on, was more widespread than what happened at Lee Lye on March 16th? In other words, other days or other places? If there is, I have no knowledge of it. It was not brought out to me in the evidence. And I personally, from my roughly 30 months in South Vietnam, I had no knowledge of anything that would approximate this. What about in the Song Mi area on that day? That charge is placed against a member of Company B who was not at Lee Lye Village. And this is the reason why, if you read that very carefully, it was expanded to include Song Mi Village as compared to Lee Lye 4, actually. Because when we got to South Vietnam, we found that Mi Lye 4, when we'd say Mi Lye 4, they didn't know what we were talking about. So we went to the Vietnamese officials 
and we got the, the proper names for the the for the village for the four hamlets that are in the village and for the sub hamlets uh, what really uh, is involved you might say in Mili 4 encompassed several of the sub hamlets that uh, of which Mili 4 is one of them actually Thuan Yen but uh, the uh, Bravo company was not in that area they were in another area further to the east but it's all within, encompassed within the greater area of Song Mi Village. And that's why we refer to it now as a Song Mi Village rather than trying to just be limited to that one little piece of, of terrain, Mi Lai 4. General Perez, as to your recommendations, you do not, do not go into recommendations and findings. However, there is one that you could discuss that would not be prejudicial to anybody. And that is, what recommendation do you or your board uh, have for preventing such reoccurrences. In other words, couldn't this have happened in the first place if written hour hadn't written a letter? And what method of internal communication and reporting do you recommend to prevent, first of all, a cover-up, and secondly, this kind of incident at all? You will notice uh, that there is one section uh, of the report devoted uh, <coughs> to the laws of war uh, and to the various regulations which were put out here in the United States uh, by the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, and... On uh, March 16th and the, say, the 10 days following, March 16th, 1968, how far up in the chain of command of the Maritime Division is personal knowledge of the incident that occurred in uh, Tom Me uh, on that day? How far did the commanders go? <clears throat> the official reports, which is to say the operational citrets, which I'm sure uh, all of you people here are familiar with, which are the, just the ordinary day-to-day -day reports indicating the statistical account of how many of the enemy were killed and so forth. These were passed all the way up through the chain of command and, as a matter of fact, to the uh, National Military Command and Control Center. But as far as the <clears throat> knowledge of what might have transpired at uh, Song Mi itself. Uh, we have no indication uh, that this got beyond the AmeriCal Division itself. Mr. McCray, the people who you mentioned who took the Fifth Amendment uh, when asked to testify, have they been charged with dereliction of duty but not with uh, uh, swearing to false statements, or have some of them not been charged with anything? I am going to have to decline to respond to that simply because we then get to identifying individuals. And as I indicated before, I fear that it would be prejudicial to individual rights to... Can you respond to, uh, to the last part of it as to whether they have been charged at all with anything? The point of my question is I'm wondering if uh, it turned out that the safest course was to refuse to testify on that grounds. Uh, I believe that uh, each of the individuals that I can recall at this time who invoked the privilege is within a group that has either been charged at this time or previously was charged. General Pierce, could I ask you a philosophical question in a way? There are some reports one an Australian officer made characterizing the, the people, the Vietnamese civilians. <coughs> of Song Mi and Mi Lai uh, as being able to build bazookas uh, at the age of four and five and six, uh, that kind of talk. What feeling do you have about the people concerned in this apparent tragedy? Well, I don't know about uh, being able to build, build a bazooka at four or five or six years of age, but I think if you look within the history of uh, the coastal region of Quang Nai province, as well as the coastal region of Binh Dinh province, that this has a long history of communism. Uh, actually going back to the time of 1920 and 1930, when communism was first uh, established, you might say, within Vietnam. Uh, <clears throat> so there's just no question but what the, this area has a tradition for being uh, under communist domination. 
and it was sold during the, uh, the war against the French, uh, and it continued to be so uh, when, <clears throat> you might say, the communists uh, decided to try to take over South Vietnam. And it, it is, it's, it's a hotbed of communism, has been. I must say that uh, I had not seen Quang Nai for almost uh, two years when Mr. McCrate and Mr. Walsh and I returned. And I was tremendously impressed with the, with the progress which has been made in pacification in that area when, when we saw it at that time. General Pierce, the fact that uh, such high-ranking high officers have been charged suggests that there were <coughs> reports that a massacre had taken place at the Lai village. Were, were there such reports, and were they physically destroyed? There was information which was available, uh, <clears throat> and there were failures to report. There were failures in investigation. There were failures in, in reviewing investigations. And these are all really part of the charges, uh, which uh, were subsequently developed. My question is somewhat different, though. Was there a positive act on anybody's part to destroy or remove evidence? <clears throat> I would prefer not to, uh, to answer that particular question, if I may, because I do think that by answering it that I may be prejudicing rights of, of individuals and... and uh, General, are you satisfied that during your investigation you found all of the photographs that Ronald Haverly says he took in the area? <clears throat> My honest opinion is yes. Oh, can you give us any idea of the dimensions of this tragedy? Uh, we've had a number of people charged with various crimes. Can you tell us how many people you think were killed, how many were raped, how many were uh, maimed, and so on? No, I, uh, above and beyond that which I indicated in my statement, uh, I'm afraid I cannot go any further at this time. General, can you give us an idea where we stand in the legal proceedings? Uh, here uh, under UCMJ, and at the end of the uh, DOJ release here, the disposition of charges cannot be determined at this time. Will the disposition of these charges be up to a, uh, a court martial, uh, court martial to be yet to be convened? What, uh, where do we go from here? Well, I think it's indicated in the uh, handout which you have that all of these people, with the exception of two of them, I have been assigned to First Army, which is to say to the command of General Seaman, uh, a lieutenant general, who will therefore have the right, to, uh, based upon the Article 32 investigation, uh, to convene uh, a court martial if uh, the findings justify it. Will these uh, court martials be public? I cannot answer that. Is that, that, that any that time Article 32 proceedings have been started on in all these cases then? No, I, to my knowledge, they have not. I can, I cannot uh, truly answer your question. We're still in the very beginning stage. Uh, charges have been leveled. That's right. And, and then the article will be to determine whether or not an Article 32 investigation should be made. Is that correct? Well, from these will stem the Article 32 investigation, and from that, if, if justifiable, then would uh, stem the court martial proceeding. Well, to uh, pin down uh, one point, uh, during your investigation, did you find that any of the information about the uh, incident uh, was conveyed to higher authority from the American Division by back channel or by personal?